Hello everyone and welcome back to the NHS Forest Conference 2023. Uh, we are just starting our second session of the day, uh, which is planning for tree planting and woodland creation on the NHS estate. Um, so welcome back if you were with us for the first session and have just come back off your break uh, or a, a very warm welcome if you're, you're just joining us now. Um, I'm going to quickly go through some housekeeping for any new people who have just joined um, before we launch into our second session of the day. Um, so just to let you all know that all of the presentations will be recorded and they will all be available on our website after the conference so you can go back and, and watch them again. Um, your cameras and microphones will be switched off during the webinar. Um, we've got quite a, a, a number of people joining us today. Um, however, there will be an opportunity to turn your cameras on and, and chat to people at our networking session at lunchtime, which we'll tell you a bit more about after this session. Um, during the panel, um, if you would like to ask any of the panellists a question, you can use the Q&A box um, and you can also upvote other questions um, if, if you like the sound of them and would like them to be answered. So please do use the Q&A box for any questions to the panellists and you can use the chat box um, to for any discussion or, or comments or anything like that. Um, you can also turn uh, captions on by clicking on the CC show captions button and that will automatically generate um, captions for you as our panellists speak. Um, as a reminder, um, our, uh, our keynote speaker for the conference, Alexis Percival, will be joining us um, for the Q&A uh, in this sec section. So we've already had her talk at the start of the session and the recording was sent round. But Alexis will be joining us for the, the discussion part of, of this panel. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to um, Ian, who is chairing the next se section. Before I do that, Ian, sorry, um, I'll just want to mention that unfortunately we can't save the chat at the moment. Um, but what we're doing is we're going to share the chat in the chat box so that you can save it. Um, and then for this afternoon's session, we'll be able to change uh, the, the settings so that we can save the chat. Um, so just keep an eye out in, in the chat for that download. But as I say, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Ian, who is chairing us for, for the next section. Thanks, Ian. That's great. Thanks, Sarah. And hi, everybody. Um, just to give you a bit of background, um, my puppy's just spotted a squirrel outside the door. So if you hear... <laughs> barking apologies it, he hates squirrels and one's just decided to appear at the back door so apologies for that anyway um i'm ian stenton and i'm the national sustainability program manager within um the nhs england estates and facilities team so i've been in the post um, a couple of years now and part of my role is to manage and support programs um to help the sustainability of the nhs estate so looking at um, our buildings um, facilities management for primary and secondary care one of the roles that I've been working on uh, over the last year or maybe 18 months or so has been look, developing some guidance on green spaces. So I've been really closely uh, working really closely with Centre for Sustainable Healthcare and NHS Forest, but also with Natural England and partners, in, including Alexis, to try and develop some, some guidance to help support um, trusts and primary care projects. So these um, include areas such as how to recruit volunteers, how to identify funding, importantly, how to work with your estates team to make sure that um, projects go ahead smoothly. And there's also a section that was developed with um, Natural England on how to work with local authorities for areas such as biodiversity net gain, which is what one of our speakers will be talking about next, which is fantastic. The guidance is currently hosted on the future NHS collaboration hub. Um, so it's only available to NHS staff. We, we are working to get this added onto the NHS England website. And there it will hopefully complement all the brilliant resources and case studies that are already available through the NHS Forest and Centre for Sustainable Healthcare website. So if you don't have access to the future NHS hub, definitely look at the, um, the NHS Forest and the CSH web, uh, website. Just a very brief background of, of me. So before I started working for NHSC, I was head of um, sustainability at Liverpool University Hospitals for seven years. And they worked really closely with Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. There's already been some questions in the chat about the nature of recovery ranges. Um, and one of the first 
of the three Rangers was um, based at Liverpool, working across Broad Green and Aintree sites. Um, and we also received an NHS Forest Award for our Therapies Garden project. Um, so we've got lots of um, experience with green space and also as part of developing the guidance, as well as the, the guides on, on volunteering and funding. There's also case studies of best practice throughout primary and secondary care um, on, on part of our green space guidance. And I've been lucky enough to visit a number of the sites. So only last week I was at um, the Pinderfield site at Mid Yorkshire that Alexis showed a, an image of. I've been to South Mead and a number of other sites to look at um, green space projects. So, so really, I'm um, really interested to to listen to, particularly looking at the chat and all the the, the varied people who are on this call. It's fantastic. Um, so we have three speakers this afternoon: um, Amanda, Jim, and Carly. As Sarah said, um, in addition to the three speakers, we'll also be joined by Alexis um, for the Q&A. Um, so if you do have questions um, and it's aimed at a specific person, please just put their name at the front so I know uh, where to answer. If we have a lot of questions, then you can go in and click the um, little thumbs up, uh, which will mean that I'll be able to prioritise it so that we ask the questions that people think will be most useful. Um, so. So that's just the Q&A. You know, I think we've got about 10 to 15 minutes, so it'll pro probably be about one question per person. So if you do have one, please let me know who it's for. Um, right, so I'll move on to our first presenter now, who's Amanda News Newsom. Uh, so Amanda um, has worked in nature conservation for over 20 years and joined the Forestry Commission about a year ago. And in the Forestry Commission, she's working to prepare staff and the forestry sector for the introduction of the new biodiversity net gain requirement, which will um, apply to NHS Trust as well. Prior to that, she worked for over 20 years for Natural England and English Nature before that, most recently on biodiversity net gain. So we're really lucky to have um, one of the experts in, in the field. So Amanda, um, I'll pass over to you. Thanks very much. So thank you for that introduction, Ian. Um, I am going to talk to you about biodiversity net gain um, and the opportunities and the challenges that that presents um, for the NHS estate. So moving on, what we're going to cover then um, is what is biodiversity net gain and how is it going to work? It sounds like some of you are already aware of that. Um, how is it relevant to you in the NHS, both as a developer and as a landowner? What you'll actually need to do to comply with it and then some of the opportunities and the challenges that you might want to be aware of. OK, so this is just a, a review of the timelines for when mandatory net gain is going to be a, become a requirement. So just at the end of September, government announced a slight delay to the commencement. So for large scale developments, it was going to be November of this year. It's now going to be January of next year. Um, the commencement for small sites is still going to be April of next year. And for nationally significant infrastructure projects, which I don't think you're involved in, it will be November of 2025. So when they made that announcement about the delay, they also helpfully announced um, that they were going to publish some things um, that will be quite useful by the end of November of this year. So they're going to publish all of the secondary legislation around the, around the regulations of how biodiversity net gain will actually operate. They're going to publish the statutory biodiversity metric. So we're currently all working on metric version four, but there will be a statutory version. That will be the one you have to use when you are um, apply, uh, submitting applications once the mandatory requirement is in place. And they will also publish supporting guidance, which will be brigaded around landowners, developers and local planning authorities. And that will take you step by step through what you need to know and do in order to comply with biodiversity net gain. So what is it? Um, it was introduced through the Environment Act. Um, so it will only apply to England when it comes into force and it applies to all appropriate developments. And the reason I say appropriate is because there are going to be some exemptions. So the definitive list of exemptions will actually be published as part of that secondary legislation, but it includes things like permitted development and householder developments and some custom um, and house uh, self-build would also be exempt. So those appropriate developments have to deliver a minimum 10% biodiversity net gain. And that has to be calcul calculated using the mandatory biodiversity net metric. And it will have to have an appropriate approved biodiversity gain plan. So it will be the local planning authority that approves that plan. And the habitat has to be secured for at least 30 years. So that's what the developments have to deliver. The Environment Act also specified that all off-site net gains, I'll come on to what off-site net gains are, they all must be registered on a national register of net gain delivery sites, and that's primarily to stop double counting. 
Um, and also something called statutory biodiversity credits must be made available as a last resort in case developers can't source um, the units that they need in order to deliver their development. So uh, why do we need biodiversity net gain? So uh, as Alexis said in her keynote speech, we are in a time of nature and climate crisis. And for many years, biodiversity is routinely being lost through development. So biodiversity net gain is providing an opportunity to reverse those losses, or at least to stop them happening. Um, it doesn't change any existing protections through current legislation and planning policy. So all the, the protections around protected sites and protected species and irreplaceable habitats still all apply. Um, but what it will do um, is it will um, it will mean that important habitats have to be compensated for on a like for like basis and that other habitats which are often currently ignored will actually have to have their biodiversity value recognised. There are three ways you can deliver a biodiversity net gain. So I've already mentioned on-site and off-site briefly. So um, on-site is basically anything within the boundary of a development, what you would probably think of as the red line boundary, and then off-site can be anywhere else. Um, and net gain is measured in biodiversity units. So um, off-site is on, sorry, on site is probably the most straightforward and potentially the cheapest option that you should be thinking of if you are um, wearing your developer hat. Off site could be on your own land, or you can buy units from a landowner, an NGO, or a habitat bank that has been set up specifically to generate and trade in biodiversity units. And then only as a last resort, if you can't get to your 10% net gain through on-site and off-site means, for example, if you can't find enough of the right kind of biodiversity units through the market, you can purchase statutory biodiversity credits from the government. But that has to be agreed with the, the local planning authority and they can only be used as a last resort. So you can't just say, I can't meet my net gain, I'm going to go and buy some credits. Okay, so the first thing you need to think about is what your baseline value of your, your on-site baseline is. So this is what the main menu page of the biodiversity metric looks like. And you can see on the left-hand side there is where you calculate your on-site baseline. So um, you basically, um, the 10% the that the, the baseline that you that you generate through through that is, the, is what the 10% net gain is then going to be measured against. And by putting that data in, you will also, it will also show you which habitats are contributing the most units towards your baseline. So the reason there are three different color bands there is because area habitats, including woodland and trees, are, are measured um, by area and they are the green, the green buttons, but there are also linear habitats. So the brown buttons are for hedgerows and the blue are for watercourses and the metric will give you a separate unit value and a percentage gain for each of those different unit types. Um, and I just draw attention to the top right hand corner of this page, which has got the tree helper in it. So I will come back to that later, but it's useful to know where that sits in the metric. So there are four pieces of information that you need to generate a biodiversity unit score for a habitat. You need to know the size, the habitat type, the condition and the strategic significance. And that gives you the baseline score for each habitat parcel. And then the metric combines those to give you an overall score. And then you do something very similar for your proposed post-development habitats. Um, and the metric will subtract the baseline from that post-development total to give you a percentage net gain or loss for your site. And there's further guidance on all of this in um, the metric for user guide. I've got a link to that at the end of the presentation. But if you are going to be doing any calculations, I do strongly advise you to have a look at that user guide before you start. So you make sure that you're using the metric in the right way. So once you've got your baseline, you could start using it to start planning and designing your development. So there are three different things that you can think about to help you towards achieving um, a biodiversity net gain on site. But the first thing is, um, can you retain habitats, including trees and woodland in situ throughout the development period? By retaining those higher value habitats on site, the ones which are scoring more of your biodiversity units at the baseline, you'll basically be reducing the deficit that you have to make up before you're then going to try and reach your 10% net gain. And if you can retain them, could you also commit to managing them in a different way to enhance or improve them in terms of their biodiversity value? That again will generate some biodiversity units. And remember, 
you don't have to achieve the improvement straight away. You've got 30 years to get to, to get to the improved state. So it's definitely worth thinking about improving some of the habitats that you might have on site. And then finally, um, will there be space in your development once it's built out to create some new habitats that will contribute to the biodiversity value of your site? So those are the three main ways that you can think about achieving a biodiversity net gain. Going back to individual trees, um, they are recorded as an area habitat. So the tree helper that I, I pointed out, that calculates an area equivalent for all of the trees that are present on a site. Um, and that's based on the number and the size of the trees. So basically you don't have to enter every tree individually into the metric. Um, I will just draw your attention to the fact that these are tables from version four of the metric. And in the final Secretary of State version, that medium size category, which currently stretches from 30 to 90 centimetres diameter at breast height, that's going to be split. So medium will become 30 to 60 centimetres and large will become 60 to 90 and then um, very large will be over 90. So the size is based on the, the diameter at breast height that then is used to extrapolate a root protection area and that's what's converted to the area that is used in the metric. It's important to note as well that the tree area is recorded in addition to any underlying habitats. So you're basically getting effectively two for the price of one if you're planting trees over, an, over a, a, another habitat. This just shows you um, some examples of um, the number of biodiversity units that you can generate by either creating or managing and improving either trees or uh, woodland. So they're all gaining, um, but they, they're all generating a number of biodiversity units per hectare and they're all generating quite a healthy percentage net gain as well. Um, I've given the, the trees in a, as, as biodiversity units per hectare and it's just worth noticing, noting that um, a, approximately 250 small trees equates to one hectare of individual trees. I've also used small trees because if you're planting trees, it's not realistic to expect them to exceed 30 centimetres diameter at breast height um, within a 30 year period that your net gain agreement uh, would relate to. OK, so back to can you deliver a biodiversity net gain on site? Um, and what can you practically do? to increase the chances of delivering some or all of that 10% net gain. So you basically need to use your baseline assessment from the earliest stages in your design and planning so, to, so that you can minimize losses of high scoring habitats and identify um, th those retained habitats that you can potentially make better to, to generate your biodiversity units. So I would encourage you to get a baseline survey of your sites as early as possible. There are also lots of ways that you can incorporate new habitats into a development. They don't have to be big areas that are set aside specifically for biodiversity net gain. What you might currently think of as green infrastructure can form part of a development and they can benefit staff and patients whilst delivering biodiversity net gains. So things like sustainable urban drainage systems, rain gardens, green roofs and walls, and one of my personal favorites, tiny forests. And obviously, because of the additionality of, of trees above other habitats, if you're planting groups, rows and individual trees, that will also help. But if you get to the end of all of that and you still have a deficit, then you will need to buy or find off-site biodiversity units or you'll need to purchase statutory biodiversity credits. But you really want to try and avoid that if at all possible, because the price of statutory credits is set deliberately high so as not to um, compete with the market, the emerging market for biodiversity units. Okay, so we'll move on to some of the opportunities uh, for you as a landowner potentially providing off-site BNG. Um, so if, for example, you can deliver more than 10% net gain on a development site, you can use the surplus units for another NHS development in the area, or you can sell them onto the market to generate some income for you to do um, enhancements elsewhere. Um, they would be treated as off-site units for the purposes of that other development, whether it was yours or someone else's. Um, I would advise you to review other sites in your ownership where you don't necessarily have any plans for development, but that may have potential to generate units through improving existing habitats or creating new habitats. It sounds like you're doing great things with meadows and things like that and, and tree planting. So you should definitely be thinking about where you have the biggest potential so that you can um, actually get some of those habitats uh, working for you um, 
to meet your net, your net game requirements for those or other, other developments. And finally, there are benefits to creating the habitat now rather or sooner than you have to, rather than waiting until um, a, you, you're planning a development. Um, so effectively, you'd be creating your own habitat bank. And the way that this is treated in the metric um, basically means that um, because the habitat has already, the work's already begun to create the habitat or improve it, and because the proposed net gains will be delivered sooner, um, that habitat actually scores higher in the metric. So you need less space to deliver the same number of units, if you like. Um, yeah. Okay. And then I've just put in tree nurseries. Um, it, it sounds like you're doing great things involving volunteers, patients and staff. Um, one of the things you could think about doing if you've got enough space on a site is actually creating your own tree nursery so that you're growing trees, you're involving people, they're getting the benefits of doing that. And then you've actually got the trees ready to use um, in your, um, your net gain for your developments to save you some money and get the satisfaction of having done that. Moving on to challenges, there are obviously quite a lot of challenges around net gain. It's a whole new system. There are obviously going to be new costs. So I'm sure you'd be keen to know how you could potentially reduce some of those. Um, and what I would suggest there is um, thinking about batching up sites for uh, baseline surveys. So um, focusing on those with a high potential for delivering biodiverse units or those where you've got a high likelihood of development. And maybe thinking about employing an ecologist to, to do some baseline surveys for you. It's either at a national or an NHS trust level. So you're getting that information, but you're getting it in the most cost effective way. There are obviously new requirements. Um, you need to think about how much help you might need with habitat creation and management advice. Um, and also how you're going to set that out in the biodiversity gain plans and the habitat management and monitoring plans. Do you have the right skills? skill set or do you need to buy that in? Um, are your legal team up to speed with um, what will be needed for biodiversity net gain legal agreements if you're thinking of using any of your um, land as off-site biodiversity net gain? Um, and also, I think um, Ian did mention this, uh, can your existing grounds maintenance contractors deliver the habitat management that's going to be needed to deliver some of those biodiversity units? So talk to them and think about this when you're uh, retendering contracts um, there is potentially a skills gap and capacity gap in the sector because they're used to, if you like, keeping things neat rather than um, managing habitats necessarily. And then finally, um, if you're going to um, be involved in off-site net gain in any way, you're going to need to know how to add sites to the National Register. Um, so you need to think about who is going to be able to do that for you. Um, this is something I always get asked about, um, the size of the market for biodiversity net gain and the price of units. And we really can't say with any certainty, um, it will be market supply and demand that will affect both of those things. So the figures on the screen here are from um, a DEFRA commissioned report that was published in 2021. And that assumed a unit price of um, 20,000 pounds per unit and that 50% of biodiversity net gain would be delivered off site. So they have more recently uh, revise those estimates based on what's happening in the voluntary biodiversity market that's been developing prior to the mandatory requirement. And they have revised um, their estimate of the unit price to between 25 and 30,000 pounds per unit. And they also think that potentially up to 90% of um, net gain will be delivered on site. So the off site market might be significantly smaller than that. Um, it's likely to be different in different areas. If you just think already about the regional um, variation that you see in land prices because of um, uh, development pressures and demand, you can expect a similar thing to happen with biodiversity units. And then finally, I just wanted to share some um, links to some useful resources in case you want to know any more. I would always say your first port of call should be the gov.uk website. So there is some information on there already. But as I said right at the beginning, by November, there should be a full set of step-by-step um, -step guidance for developers, landowners and local planning authorities. Top right, we've got the biodiversity metric page. So that has the actual calculation tool itself. Um, the user guide, which again, I will say, have a look at it if you're going to do anything that involves the metric and also some case studies on how to use it. That will move across to gov.uk website once the statutory metric is published in November. Um, so SIEM, they produce best practice guidance and they also produce regular training on net gain and use of the metric. There's a British standard and um, the Local Government Association Planning Advisory Service also has a lot of resources. They're designed for local planning authorities, but they are quite useful more generally. And so that's, that's a, a, 
a very rapid run through um, biodiversity net gain. And so hopefully you're aware of some of the opportunities and the challenges that that will present for you. Um, there's lots of new terminology and processes to get your head around, I appreciate. Um, but yes, I guess it's up to you how proactive you want to be about providing units for other developments, either within or outside the NHS estate. But you will have to comply with the 10% requirement for any developments that you're actually undertaking. So back to my um, main take home message, I think, is think about getting a baseline assessment for those sites where you already know that there's going to be um, development or where you think there's the, the greatest um, potential for delivering net gains. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Thanks, Amanda. Um, that was really, really interesting and a lot of things for um, people in the NHS to consider, which is great. So we, I think there are, like you said, there's two aspects of this. One is that if you're hoping to develop green space projects on your site to be aware that there's funding available, the idea that if you need to do it to add an extra bit on top of your 10% to have credits to sell is fantastic. I think for the NHS, it's a real opportunity to try and get some funds in to develop green space projects. Um, and then the other side of the, the thing is that if you have, um, if you're in a trust and you know that there's a big project that's coming down the line where you'll need to meet biodiverse net gain, and we've already been contacted by some trusts that have been asked by the local authority to work out the what the biodiversity net gain will be when it's on site. As sustainability leads and people who are really interested in green space, so everybody on this call gives you a great opportunity to work with your trust and work with senior managers to make sure that you make the case that it should be on site where it can try and keep the funds within the NHS. Um, there are all the issues that we've experienced when talking to estates colleagues about the 30 year aspect of that. Um, some estates people have very nervous about anything that has to means it can't be built. You can't put a multi-story car park on there for 30 years. Um, but there's really great opportunities. So I, I would um, ask anyone who knows about a big construction project on their site to start to consider biodiversity net gain and, and what they can do on site or if, if they've got a number of sites, what they can do there. And then anybody who's got projects that they're looking for um, for funding for to start to think about how how that can be done. We'll be, because we're, we're working really closely with um, Natural England. So we're hoping we can get some kind of um, register so that people um, can start to, we can start to get some um, credits up and running for the NHS so that we make sure that we benefit from um, those, that couple of hundred million pounds that you put on the screen, which I'm <laughs> sure would be very welcome. <laughs> so that was really useful. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, we've had quite a few um, questions in the chat. So um we because we do have limited time if there's something that someone's put in that you really want to um to be discussed then um please use the little thumbs up so that we know uh, right so going to move on to our second presenter who is jim smith who also works for the um, forestry commission as national urban forestry advisor so um jim's been an urban forester for over 35 years and has worked previously at the forest um, commission straight after leaving school and then worked at other places including the royal parks He's a chartered member of the ICS, ICF, sorry, um, has been the chair of London Tree Officers Association twice, um, and also has um, produced, been the lead on lots and lots of documents, particularly around tree planting. And uh, so he was appointed London Tree and Woodland Framework Manager in 2006, and now is the National Urban Forestry Advisor for uh, Forestry Commission. And Jim's going to talk about um, the challenges of planting trees in urban areas and what we can learn from the NHS estate, which is fantastic. Thank you, Jim. Thanks very much, Ian. I'll just start sharing my screen. Hopefully that will work nicely. Uh, has that come up? Yeah, we've just got all the slides. If you just click on the slide, yeah. yeah. There we go. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, I'll just I'll just go run through it then. So thanks very much, Ian. So I'm Jim Smith. I'm the uh, National Urban Forestry Advisor for the Forest Commission. As Ian has said, I'm going to take you a, a very brief whistle stop tour of urban tree planting um, down to the nitty gritty, uh, but also how it's relevant to the national um, uh, the NH forest NHS forest estate. So trees at the moment, they're now tier one in terms of government policy. Um, so they're really high up the agenda and the, the policy and funding environment for trees, urban trees has never been better. 
and that's due to the manifesto commitment for all new streets to have trees planted on them and that flowed from um, some of you may have heard of the um, the government's response to the building better building beautiful commissions report living with beauty but I'm going to just um, um, stop there for a minute and use speaker's prerogative just to, to give provide a tiny bit of challenge to um, a couple of the speakers James and David this morning because um, I just wanted to highlight the fact that James mentioned about air quality and and, uh, and the the way that trees may actually impact never negatively on that, and I completely agree with that in the co in context. And that uh, new app is going to be brilliant in terms of uh, targeting trees in uh, very centralised urban areas. But I just like to highlight that the the nice um, guidance NG seven NG seventy that was published in two thousand seventeen uh, on air pollution and outdoor air quality. Um, actually recommended it and it was um, James you're in good company because I've had this discussion with Rob McKenzie a few times because he was on our urban frack network but um, and Rob act actually helped the urban frack network respond to that nice consultation and we got in there a bullet point and I'm going to read it to you it's to avoid the creation of street and building configurations such as deep street canyons that encourage pollution to build up where people spend time that links to what David was saying about development in urban areas being quite sporadic and not you know not being relevant but my view and I've been a planning tree officer um, for 14 years before joining the Forest Commission is that um, those those areas in our very centralized urban areas the building cycles have dropped from 100 down to 60 and they're now down to 30 years particularly residential blocks um, but um, even commercial commercial um, uh, building cycle is even shorter than that so the opportunities for creating new new buildings that are set back from roads and streets um, are, are there and we need to op optimize them but i'll also add that um that the majority of roads and streets in 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 uk towns and cities um the buildings are, are usually set back anyway though some of them edwardian obviously terrace is not but um you do get that crinkliness it's it's there already and what we've been doing over the last 20 or 30 years is doing away with that crinkliness and building building very densely densely um built elevations which create that problem of air pollution so that's my well a little bit on vocs as well um ma majority of vocs in urban areas are produced through uh, human activity so industry and agriculture um, James mentioned via trees, trees producing VOCs, and I, I don't disagree with that. But the the expert air quality uh, report highlighted the fact that the, the chemical reaction about that is um, driven actually by vehicle exhausts, and the VOCs that trees permit, in comparison to the human activity ones, is is pretty minor and small. But we've got to remember that the trees we're planting now, so trees that we plant now, will mature in terms of their eco ecosystem services and their delivery. If they produce VOCs, the delivery of that will mature in about 20 to 30 years time or when actually when um, we're hoping if we're to be believed that um, vehicle exhaust will be a thing of the past in those central business districts and central areas, the areas that James highlighted. So I would just caution don't prevent uh, tree planting in urban areas based on that solely, um, but you certainly use James's app. It looks really interesting, but that's my rant for the minute. I'm going to go on now in terms of tree planting generally in urban areas. So the biggest issue for planting trees in urban areas is accommodating the desired future growth of the tree. We have to remember that cities are artificial creations. Trees are living, breathing organisms that require the same basic needs as humans to, to thrive. They need space, water, air, light and nutrients. But un, unlike other assets, buildings, roads and urban infrastructure, they do not remain static. They grow they change their state and their needs and requirements alter over time. We have to prepare for that when we're planting them. Um, now, some of you may know that the Forest Commission has had a, a really long association with the NHS Forest. When I joined the FC in 2006, um, my then boss, Ron Melville, uh, who was the region, London Region Director, used to have regular meetings with Samuel Gray, who I'm sure you know is um, a, a, a really a vocal advocate of a, an active lifestyle. And the FC were partnering with the NHS Forest from a very, very early age. And we actually gave grants to some hospitals in London through our London Tree and Woodland Grant Scheme for planting on, on sites. Uh, it's very successful um, and this site this hospital here is it's actually my local hospital it's the Whitting Hospital in North London and that was redeveloped I think I was the the the, the tree the planning tree officer at the time that that was developed in Islington and I think the um, the reason we got such a great um, provision for trees on the on this site when it was redeveloped it had some pre-existing sites on there already which were which had TPOs on them pre-preservation orders on them 
but the chief executive of the trust absolutely went to town on making sure that trees were incorporated into design when it was project when it was built um uh, and you can see that they had you know allocated space and planted trees and that block just behind those trees is the new ward block so uh, um I think the chief executive really took on board um, the research that Ulrich did in the 70s about um, patients getting better quicker if they have sight of green infrastructure. Uh, and this this hospital, some of you may know, is in Archway, so pretty pretty ungreen, as it were, sort of thing. So it's made of a re- not just for people in the hospital, for people who walk by and live near it as well. So that's been a really important um, benefit. And I think I'll be coming back to that in terms of what um uh, nhs forest can provide for the nhs estate going forward um alex alex alexis has already mentioned the england tree action plan that's the policy document that underpins all forest human activity in this area um mentions obviously woodlands and woodland creation um and managing our woodlands better but it also has some sections on urban tree planting as well which is really helpful uh, what i'd like to draw your attention to though is the right tree right uh, right tree in the right place for resilient future this is the urban tree manual which was produced in response to the government's commitment for a million new urban trees and it supports the um its tree planting grants which i'll talk about a bit more in a bit later but i would um certainly uh, suggest that you go and um uh, look that up on google it google, google the urban tree manual it's on forest research site some other documents the barriers to drivers to tree planting and retention in urban areas that's got some good guidance and some good solutions as well British Standard Institute, Trees from Nursery, uh, BS 8545, and then the Streetworks UK, which is about planting trees near utilities. But the main problems are the lack of integrated planning process, poorly specified PFI contracts, you may be aware of what happened in Sheffield, perceptions of damage, direct and indirect damage, and conflict with utilities as well, uh, and misinformation. Uh, also, some of the barriers are inflexible organisations, negative perceptions, compensation culture, some of the drivers, legislation, getting trees planted through the planning system etc tree strategies and also government grants which i'll talk about in a minute alexis showed some car parks this isn't a car park in a, in a hospital but it's my local re- retail park but you can see that the the parking uh, the tree but the tree sort of pits have been integrated into parking bay so that lots of the vehicles just whack the trees when they go along and then they, they wobble about and they're predisposed to wind wind throw so try and avoid that uh, but on some of the sites that you've got, NHS hospital sites, you've got much larger areas where you can put some really decent trees in. Uh, but the government funding for this is underwritten by the Nature of the Climate Fund, which is a, um, a £650 million pound fund, which, is, uh, as I understand it, is, is actually one of the principal funders for the 150,000 trees that Alexis mentioned earlier. We've also got the Urban Tree Challenge Fund, which is specifically for urban areas and which hospital trusts can access grant funding to plant on their own sites, and then the local authority treescapes fund as well. But the Urban Tree Challenge Fund is about tree planting um, uh, uh, standards only. It's got a biosecure procurement requirements, and it's targeted at low canopy areas and areas of deprivation. And it's got hard surface payments and trial pits. But uniquely, it now covers three years of maintenance. I've mentioned the, the local authority treescapes fund, although that you can't access that on the NHS uh, specifically, what you can do is negotiate with your local authorities. If they've got land around the hospitals, they could access this grant to green up the area around the hospitals. So what are the best things that you can do when you're planting an urban tree? Well, choose the site well, fit the tree species to the location or vice versa. So if you're creating a new site, make sure you've got enough soil rooting volume for the tree's potential size. Water it well in the first three to five years. Keep it well weeded and mulched. Check its stakes and adjust if it needed and remove them after three years and remove any metal grills. So what you would then get, this is a site um, in Islington where pre-existing trees and then new trees on the left were planted. It's not a hospital site, but you can really make a difference if you get that right. And that's what they did. This this is Old Street Parade of Lights. This is a, a site in Frankfurt, Germany, actually, where it really shows um, multi-purpose use of areas around trees, which can be done if we plan it right. Uh, and this is Kingsway. I'm going to tip my hat back to James now, because this is one of those canyons that you're talking about, James. And although these trees, um, uh, I took this picture from the top of BBC Bush House, these trees do have some gaps in the canopy. Um, based on the research that Rob and James and his colleagues at, at Birmingham have done, I wouldn't be averse to some judicious pruning of this sort of site uh, if needed, or even removal of one or two trees just to get that airflow going back to it. But I wouldn't want to see no trees at all on this sort of location. The reason I use these uh, these slides is this slide was taken in 1950. It was part of the London Development Plan. And that's it. 
uh, I took this shot in 2010, I think it was. So it's about 50 to 60 years between the two. And the reason I use these um, slides is that um, when I first started using the slide, it used to be the case that I would say, oh, we've got about 50 years before climate change kicks in. In the time I've been using this particular slide, that's concentrated up to 10 to 20 years, people are now talking about it. So we really need to plant those trees now. And one thing, our lessons for the NHS estate, you really need political buy-in from your chief executives. That happened in Whittington. It was really important and useful. But we also, all the professions need to work together to deliver these, these uh, benefits. So I'm, I'm just over time. So thank you for listening. That's it. I'll stop sharing. That's fantastic. Thank you, Jim. Some really great photos of best practice and um, less good practice. Um, so no, that, that's, um, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, and we've got a couple of questions that we can um, ask you um, when we get to the end as well. So it's fantastic. Um, as we're um, ahead of schedule, which is great, it'll give us more time for questions. I'll move straight on to Carly, if that's OK. So Carly Harper is... Um, the Woodland Creation Accelerator Funds Project Coordinator and has worked for City for Trees since January 20, 20, well, January this year, specialising in stakeholder and community engagement. Um, as part of her role, she works with local authorities, organisations and wider stakeholders to identify potential planting sites and explore opportunities to increase woodlands across Greater Manchester, which is where I'm based today. So really looking forward to hearing um, what you're covering. Thanks, Carly. Thank you. I'll just pull up my slides. Let me know if you can see those okay, I think. They should be yeah. on now. Yep, they're perfect. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And um, yeah, you've outlined my role quite well. I started with City of Trees uh, this year in January uh, 2023. And I came on board specifically for the Woodland Creation Accelerator Fund. But for those of you that don't know about us, City of Trees is a community forest. It's one of 30 nationally. We're funded via DEFRA. And we work with Greater Manchester landowners, either public or private, um, to create a green climate resilient landscape for Greater Manchester and help to improve the quality of life of people through trees and woods. And we do that in a number of different ways. So we have volunteer opportunities, we have corporate days, we work with schools, we have a nature for health arm, we do woodland management, we obviously work with communities, um, and we also have programmes to um, involve people and, and increase access to green jobs. So we're multi-branched, if you will, and um, trying to get the tree agenda across Greater Manchester in lots of different ways. But as I said, my role is really primarily around Woodland Creation Accelerator Fund. And I have a team of three officers who work with me on this fund. And we, as I said, work across Greater Manchester. So the Woodland Creation Accelerator Fund um, is Forestry Commission funded. And we've been commissioned by Greater Manchester Combined Authority to run this project. And the idea is to increase tree planting across Greater Manchester. So yes, woodlands definitely, as the name suggests, but obviously because we are in a very urban environment in Manchester and semi-urban in areas around Greater Manchester, we do also look at the opportunities in standards planting and, and certainly support our landowners in accessing um, opportunities and funding to increase um, standard planting. What we know from our work in Greater Manchester across the number of years that we've been established is that people tell us that they don't have capacity to plant trees. And this comes in a number of different forms. Either they don't know what trees to plant, they don't know where they should be planting, um, they don't know anything about funding opportunities, or they just don't have the time to go out and find those places to plant. So we really work there to uncover those opportunities and we act as a capacity to our um, landowners and when I say capacity it is to address all of those issues and barriers we hear about but also to try and add value where we can and really help people understand what planting could do for their land. So in terms of NHS sites and really thinking I've got an example here of Stepping Hill Hospital which is in Stockport in Greater Manchester uh, we've started to work uh, with the NHS Cross Greater Manchester to understand where the potential is, where we can link up with NHS Forest and how we can help complement that. And 
that uh, capacity really comes in terms of these kinds of things. So service checks, considerations around how you're already using the land, um, whether it's for for parking, which, uh, you know, I've worked for the NHS, I understand that that's a hot spot, um, whether it's for future development or whether it's a, a place where patients and staff and family can go. Uh, understanding how the land's used and then what planting would complement it is a really important part of the process and something that my team can certainly look at and think about. We also look at species selection. So what have you got already? How can we increase that biodiversity? What works well? What concerns have your estates teams got? Um, and we pull together planting plans. And I've just an example here of what we were looking at at Stepping Hill. So very briefly in the top corner, you can see we had a look at services and being such a large hospital, we knew there was going to be challenges. Uh, but the team at Stepping Hill really wanted to see some more green and what, where the possibilities were. Following a site visit, service checks and all those considerations, we were looking at how we could get some proposed standards into the ground. Um, and you can see from our reporting on the Stepping Hill Hospital, we were thinking about which kind of species would go where, thinking about um, linking up um, buildings with tree names and, and matching in the tree species and also looking at where where the staff really wanted to think about seeing more greenery and where that would benefit patients. Um, but we also look at delivery options. So as I mentioned, one of those constraints that we, we do know that people have, one of those barriers is where is that funding? And, and very thanks to James Smith for mentioning things like the Urban Tree Challenge in the last presentation. We're able to really help landowners understand what is available for them. Um, in some in some instances, we're able to apply on their behalf, so we're able to help them navigate that system. But really, we're raising that awareness at all points of what is possible and the art of the possible. So, I guess from my point of view, Woodland Creation Accelerator Fund really helps to demystify some of the tree planting barriers that people face and organizations face and especially when we're thinking about NHS and thinking about budgets and using that money in the best possible way um, I believe that this kind of project and this kind of scheme can really help uncover potential for planting across Greater Manchester and as I said it's not just standards we also look at um uh, woodland and in some areas we can also offer uh, 15 years maintenance on that woodland and, and three years maintenance on on standard trees so another issue that we do hear from our estates colleagues in NHS is this is and not just the NHS to be honest but one of the issues we do here is that this is all fine now but what do we do later down the line who's going to look after it how are we going to manage this so we do try and um make sure that people understand that there is maintenance attached, there is establishment attached to some of the funding offers and really think about how that fits in line with what they need and what we can offer to try and um, get the best possible deal for everybody. Alongside this, we do also work with our local authority colleagues. So if you do have um, areas of land around you that is not owned by the hospital, but is owned by the local authority, and you feel like there's opportunity for planting there, we are able to work with our colleagues to uncover those opportunities and really encourage and, and plan and um, planting to try and enhance what is available and what green can be um, can be on the ground. So I did just put in this brief um, case study on Bolton Hospital. This was done in 2021, so slightly before our Woodland Creation Accelerator Fund came on board. But it was really an example of how just one member of staff um, attending one of our community events actually decided that they wanted to see that positive change and wanted to increase green in their area around their hospital. And so through that introduction to their estates team, we were able to get some trees in the ground. Uh, we've got a woodland that's been planted, which is doing great. And we've also got some fantastic standards which have really just helped enhance the local area and create a nicer place for people to visit. So um, it is there for you to be able to read. We did fruit trees in that instance, but um, we're always looking for lots of different opportunities. I guess from my point of view is, obviously you've got us in Greater Manchester and we're more than happy to help if you've got something in mind, especially if you've got your climate action plan targets, 
and you're wondering how are you going to um, increase that biodiversity how are you going to get trees in the ground if you don't know where to start we're more than happy to come along and do some site visits and constraint checks and help you on your way uh, we want you to create better places for staff and patients and visitors if it's not us that can help you we will always pass on to colleagues who can support so don't be afraid to reach out to me even if you're not in the greater Manchester area you know and assist with that local nature recovery and let's get more trees in the ground so that was just a whistle stop tour I guess of the Woodland Creation Accelerator Fund and how we can and um, support our NHS colleagues. That's fantastic. Thank you, Carly. Some really good examples there, particularly um, based on hospitals, which is fantastic. We've got um, lots of sites and lots of opportunities to, to go through. Um, so that's it from the, the three presenters. Um, if I can ask um, Jim, Amanda and Alexis to join for our Q&A. Um, so thanks to everyone who's asked questions. Um, Amanda's replied to a couple, which is fantastic. Um, and thanks also to people who've done the thumbs up. It looks like the two highest thumbs up are questions for me, really. So um, we might have time for them later on. But if we start with um, BNG, Amanda, um, I say thanks very much for an um, answering some of the questions online. I misread one question, so I'll ask you two questions at once, if that's okay. So somebody put a question in about um, what is there, are there any requirements for sites that don't have any um, developments ongoing, um, which, which you might not, not know because it falls outside of BNG. But how I read it, which um, was a question I've been thinking about as well, was if you do... Uh, a biodiversity audits and you have zero biodiversity on site does it mean your 10 percent uplift is zero as well yeah it does okay. so you, you basically you can't have 10 percent of nothing 10 percent of nothing yeah. is nothing so there is there is um stuff in the guidance that says basically you know you can still do things and you should still do things but you obviously can't measure it and, and right. local planning authorities may want to set policy for those specific scenarios where there is a zero baseline they might want to say you know one unit per hectare or something like that but it, it is down to their discretion because you're okay. absolutely right you can't you can't measure 10 percent of nothing great and, and what was the your... actual question yes yeah, <laughs> so <that was> <laughs> <laughs> the question was about requirements for sites that aren't undergoing um so there are no there aren't the, the the requirement is pure it's it's from the environment act but it, it relates purely to town and country planning act development and NSIP development so it's only things that are in scope within town and country planning act development that's the only thing that by the list you know again requirement applies to so there's no right. requirement on other sites fantastic there are a couple of other um techie um questions i think this one might have been incorporated into your presentation about the idea of um, how many hectares of off-site habitat creation would be needed annually? So I, yeah I think in that slide I basically said it's a it's finger in the air we can't the people can spend their lives making you know doing estimates and um, I heard some uh, the other day someone who was working up in Northumberland saying in one of their particular areas obviously it's, a lot of a lot of space not a lot of people up there they reckoned that the the demand might be 20 hectares a year which is tiny but you know if, you, if you're looking in, in some of the areas where there's a lot more development and a lot more people then potentially it's it's going to be higher than that so yeah we, i think we just basically have to wait and see fantastic thank you um and i'll go I'll, if we'll probably have time for more questions so i'll move on to a question that i think carl oh, my q and a keeps moving carly or Alexis might be able to to answer. Sorry, it keeps every time someone puts a new question, it scrolls down. So it is. No, that's the wrong one. It was basically it was about anyway about linking up areas and what can we do to link up areas of green space? Um, because the NHS has so many sites. Um, are there any opportunities for for doing that? I don't know if someone's moved that. That question now sorry but yeah I, i'm thinking particularly about um local nature recovery strategies and and the nature corridors so um alexis do you want to jump in first and then i'll uh, just get yeah. on top of the GM. Uh, so in um uh, myself and um some of the nhs england team are looking at working what we could do with local nature recovery corridors um so we're working with natural england to look at where there's the opportunities around the UK and, and 
it doesn't just have to be nature corridors. We need to link our NHS sites to other uh, sites that we can kind of combine all of those different elements. So it might be the meadows, it might be tree um, forest areas, it might be creating those urban environments, but also working with Joe Public to kind of engage as part of this strategy. Uh, we all need to be part of this plan. And, and I think with the creation of the ICS, there's the opportunity to look at what we could do for getting civic society involved in this. So working with councils and working with um, local nature reserves, we can have that combined effort and it could be surreptitious. So I think there's a lot of different things that we need to look at, but we all need to start working together on a lot of this strategy. Um, and, and Carly, you may have some other ideas on what, what we can do as well. I think that's great. And absolutely working together is is key here. Um, I can give an example of work that we're doing in Oldham at the moment, where I ran a workshop with our local authority to identify existing green spaces. And then how do we link it up with other plans we've got? We had NHS representation in that. So we're really thinking about what's out there now, what's planned and what do people want to see? Trying to create that more holistic view of, of, of how to create a I don't know, a more rounded greenway in Oldham, I guess, and help um, achieve their, their planting plans, but also to link up those natural habitat corridors and increase tree canopy cover just, you know, in, in the wide. But it, it's all about partnership at this point, isn't it, really? And Jim, with the, a lot of the guidance that you've been involved in, is, is the creation of habitat corridors or linking up different types of um, green spaces been part of that guidance too? Always, yes. I, I think uh, um, Natural England did some work on it and uh, on the um, the things like um, rail, rail networks, road networks, that sort of thing that are planted up with green infrastructure. And it was, I think they've come down on the side, yes, it's really important. And it's it's really um, for allowing invertebrates and other other types of uh, wildlife to actually travel along those those sort of corridors to get to, to get from one site to that. And it's recognised that woodland that's connected to other woodland is, is much better better than isolated patches of woodland certainly yeah and the same goes for for locations in towns as well so yeah fantastic I know um for those who don't work for the NHS um relatively recently um different pa patches I don't know um geographical areas have been set up as integrated care systems or ICSs um so they've very they're very varied so Greater Manchester's one whereas um, Shropshire's also one, which is obviously much smaller from a um, a population perspective. But all of the ICSs will be asked to develop in um, estate infrastructure strategies within the next year or so. So there's a real opportunity there to look at green space across the whole. Um, and we're also developed some guidance to ask the people who are supporting the ICS estate infrastructure strategies to make sure that they link into the local nature recovery strategies because ICS patches are all not it won't always be exact an exact match but they'll um, align with a lot of the um, local nature recovery partnerships so there'll be there should be real opportunities for anyone who's on this call who works either for a local authority or who works for the nhs for nhs to support local authorities with the development of strategies and vice versa for um the local um, local authorities to support the nhs as they do them so that's fantastic. Thank you. Question. This is, I don't know whether this will be um, Jim or Amanda. Um, question. Are there enough trees or diversity of trees being grown in UK nurseries to support biodiversity net gain targets? Shall I take that, Amanda? You can take that, Jim. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, good question, because um, as I said in my presentation, the policy environment for tree planting has never been better. And there have been shortages of certain species of trees in, in, in the UK nursery market. A lot of trees were imported from Europe. Um, uh, there's now some uh, um, restrictions on importing things like plane and oak uh, at the moment for various reasons. Um, but we found with, uh, and certainly in the context of our, our, the UTCF and the LATF, um, because the, there's been such an uplift in tree planting across the country, across the whole of the country, um, some nurseries have... have um, um, not run out of them, but they're not on stream. They, uh, it takes about between seven to ten years to plant to, to grow a standard tree from its seedling to, to something you can put into into a, into a, a hospital grounds or something like that. As long you know, if it's not a whip or a, fe a feather, so that that 
definitely the case. I think the, the, the I mentioned that the urban tree manual. There's a section in there about procurement and suggesting that big organisations. We, we in that document we suggest local authorities, but I, I guess the NHS Trust could be one. Um, we we go, we've got um, one of our my colleagues, our London region colleagues, London area colleagues, have got a meeting with Berkeley Homes um, next month, and where they Berkeley Homes have their own tree nursery. So I think um, the idea is that um, that those nurseries they will produce in terms of um, species uh, for biodiversity, et cetera, those which the market will entail. So I suspect at the moment there's a shortage of um, uh, some of the trees that are needed for this sort of uh, approach. But once it comes on stream, nurseries will react to that and uh, and start growing more of the ones that they need. What I would say, though, is that um, um, in, in the urban context, um, exotic trees, so non-native trees, are just as valuable for um, wildlife and biodiversity in terms of providing food sources and seasonal seasonal um, uh, habitat and that sort of thing as native trees. I've got to say that because that's, you know, that we've been planting non-natives in urban centres for centuries and they do really well. Great. And obviously we've mentioned about NHS forests have trees as well. So mm -hmm. that's something to consider. I know we, we, we've realised through public sector decarbonisation scheme funding, which supports local authorities, schools, central government and NHS to, to move away from fossil fuel heating, that when you um, suddenly announce a big policy change and everybody does the same thing at the same time, it can be really diff difficult with price inflation and supply chain issues. So there is a, a scope for this as well, isn't it? From January, everybody will be trying to do the same thing. Well, I think I think the nursery market are doing that at the moment. They're, they're seeing it coming, but um, there is there is actually um, another grant that the Forestry Commission and DEFRA run for uh, innovative solutions for nurseries. So uh, actually gearing up for that very thing. So uh, and there, there've been some research doing uh, doing uh, looking into what species are going to be appropriate for the future. And there's a there was a question in the Q and A's about. Um, planting trees that so they don't cause damage for buildings and there's a there's a piece of research going on at this very minute that's looking into that so great two two answers in one thanks for that jim um carl is a question for you um about uh, do you have an equivalent organization in scotland um i know you said there were different um forest groups so if you don't just focus on scotland but are the ones right throughout the uk yeah absolutely and i think i answered that privately to say i'd i'd come back with more information all right, fantastic. Thank you. Um, right, two questions which are about biodiversity net gain, but not necessarily um, just for, for Amanda to answer. Anyone can jump in with this. So one is about to what extent do the requirements um, mean that the upgrades need to be appropriate to local landscape and its existing habitat? And there's also one about um, how you can use BNG projects for to show equity of impact of health. So f rather than just have a, a baseline and work on the 10%, is is it up to individual organisations or would it be up to local authority requirements or is there certain guidance about how you can really enhance that, not just go for 10% bigger, bigger, but look at um, local, local landscape, local impacts and also the health equalities? Uh, I, I I can't answer anything about the health inequalities, but I can I can talk about the, the sort of the, the the broad principles. So there there is um, yeah the, the the biodiversity net gain is not there to just replace all other sensible ecological knowledge and advice. So it's just a requirement, but you should still be using ecologists who know the area and are proposing um, habitat creation and enhancement that is appropriate to your local area. Um, so it's not just about scoring points, although a lot of people seem to think that it is. It, there still should be some ecological grounding in, in terms of what you're doing. So, you know, in the same way that you can't create a peat bog on chalk and you can't create a chalk grassland on a peat bog, you, you, there's got to be some logic around that. There's also, um, when you're putting information into the metric, there's something called um, strategic significance. No, spatial risk, spatial risk. The spatial risk multiplier and that 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 tries to incentivize delivering the the replacement habitat close to where the loss occurred um, and that's that's based on um being within the same or an well be, being within the same local planning authority area or the same um national character area so national character areas cover the whole of england and they basically are 
if, if you like, areas that have similarities in terms of the landscape and the habitat. So again, if you think about um, which local, um, national character area your development is sitting in, that should be able to give you a, quite a good indication of the kinds of habitats um, and the, the species that they support that you should be thinking about. So it's not just about a numbers game. It's not just numbers in, numbers out. There, there, there does actually need to be some, some ecological rationale behind it. And, and that's quite a good steer, um, I think. Great, fantastic. That's really useful. And I think with the people on this um, on this um, conference who work for NHS trusts and have an interest in green space, it'd be um, for them as well to raise the issue, wouldn't it? That it's not just chasing the ten percent for yeah, the yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think that that's something to think about if you're purchasing offsite units. Is purchase ones that make sense in your area, but it is also probably worth just saying that the the habitats that are incorporated into the metric they're actually really good for um, urban and built environment. There's quite a lot of different types, so that obviously they're not they're not sort of like um, particularly restricted to certain areas. But it is worth having a look at the list of things that you can incorporate into a development that will actually generate biodiversity units. So as I said, there's you know green roofs, green walls, but there's um, there's ponds, um, artificial ponds, um, green planters, all sorts of things that that help to, to yeah make your your space a better space for people but also actually generate some biodiversity value great fantastic thank you it was laura's asked a question about sources of grant funding and um, to develop green spaces so we've already talked about the opportunities through biodiversity net gain particularly um, using those off-site credits and i think from an nhs perspective it'd be really useful to look at what developments are planned for your um ics or sub-region to see if we if we if we know that an NHS project has to pay for offsite um, biodiversity net gain credits, it makes total sense that those offsite ones should be um, moved onto a an NHS another NHS site if, if at all possible. Um, the one of the guides that uh, we've published on the future NHS hub has a list of um, potential funders. I don't know. Does anybody on the call have? Um, details that they can send or know have um, been really successful with with funding for green spaces on NHS sites? There is the um, uh, NHS Charities Communities Fund, which is opening up. Um, the, so it's the Greener Communities Fund. And I think it opens the end of October. Um, and that's for applications. I think they've got uh, a variety of options up to £100,000 that you can apply for um, as a grant funding process. There's obviously all the, the funds that James has listed um, as well. And there, there's lots of different grants and part funded um, funding pots that are around for trees and for green spaces. Uh, so it's worthwhile looking on a um, a city-wide aspect so we, we've got a variety of different forests across the the north uh, and there's scattering of them around the UK so that they have different funding parts there's obviously the ones through uh, Forestry Commission and, and a variety of other routes as well so it's worthwhile just looking regionally as well as city-wide and then nationally to see if there's anything that are in climate emergency funds that uh, is available. Fantastic thank you and um, this one might might be you Carly um got some examples so this is from Nora so it's a bit of a long one but where hospitals are on travel to school right school routes is anyone aware or do, do you know in Greater Manchester of any work where councils have been able to work with NHS sites potentially in the future to use the off-site BNG credits to try and create those green corridors and, and, and encourage um, school children to access green space and biodiversity on school routes I'm, I'm not aware of that in Greater Manchester. However, um, it's certainly something I'll be bringing up with my local authority colleagues to see if it's something we can look at linking into. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, could, really I, could I just come in there and just to say, um, so the link with Biodiversity Net again in the local nature recovery strategies. So it's worth thinking about. Um, so they are going to work at quite a large scale, a county scale, but I, I'm not entirely sure how much detail they're going to get into in urban areas, but I think that we need to we need to remind them that, 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 that they need to have, you know, priority areas and opportunity areas within within urban areas. And if you've, you've got specific um, um, ideas of where, where that can that can um, that can help, then um, yeah, get them into the local nature recovery strategy. And then there's 
something called um, the strategic significance measure in the biodiversity net gain metric, and that gets you a 15% uplift in the value of the habitats if they are mapped in the local nature recovery strategy. So that's a nice link between all three of those things. Right. So it's definitely important that people start to look at that at the, at, from the as they're being developed. Right. I'll just um, quickly to get... Um through some of the ones that might be for me. So Alicia, I absolutely love your um, question. So would any hospitals allow um, the performance of Baroque music on their rooftop towards raising funds for a rooftop garden? So when I was at Liverpool, we had a um, Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra come in at the, um, they did a, a um, free tickets for key workers. Um, and we were really keen that we didn't just advertise it and all the consultants were like, oh, I'll go to the field for free. So they played at the clock in and clock out of the Soft FM um, contractors, so the cleaners, the porters um, and the catering staff, and they just ha had an orchestra there who were playing as people were, were going in and out of their shifts. So if anybody wants to take um, Alicia up, um, then feel free to um, send her a message on the chat. Um, so that, that's fantastic. Thanks for that. Um, and then Lucy um, at Liverpool has asked about if there's any um, way that we can um, do a collective approach for the baselining of NHS estates. So um, Amanda said that you need to get someone in to do that assessment to look at what the baseline is if you've got the projects. It might be that that's something that could be done at an ICS level, particularly with the infrastructure strategy. So um ICSs and estates directors should have an overview of what the um, development needs will be over the next five to 10 years and could look at it that way. Um, and then we, we could also look at what we could do centrally to share some of the best practice so where trusts have already had to do baselines to see um, what aspects of that have done. But I assume, Amanda, that it's not something that we could create a, a checklist and someone without who wasn't a trained ecologist could go and do the baseline for this. I, I would, I think you, you potentially could um, if, if you haven't got any, well, it depends on the type of habitats you've got and how detailed the condition assessment needs to be because they are quite, they're quite basic. The condition assessments is, is this, is this the case or isn't it? So it's kind of like a yes, no thing. You don't have to do loads of quadrats and things like that. You have to be able to decide which ha which habitat types you've got. So that's the probably the most key ecological thing. But if you're looking at um, an already, you know, urban or built up site, then potentially you could. So the small sites metric, I didn't mention the small sites metric at all. But if you remember, there's, there's a split commencement time. So major developments go first. They have to use the main metric. If, um, if a development is... A, at below a certain threshold in terms of its size and it doesn't have any um what, what are called high distinctiveness habitats in it you can use the small sites metric and the guidance for that is specifically that you don't need to be an ecologist you just need to be competent to identify the habitats that are present on site at the time of year that you're surveying them so if you've got knowledgeable people then yeah go out and have a go at doing your baseline and at least it will give you a pretty good indication of what the baseline is and where those more valuable habitats that are scoring more highly are and then at the point when you come to work up your actual planning application you'll probably be employing consultant ecologists anyway so you can give them that information and then they can refine it maybe okay that's fantastic that's really useful thank you so um, alexis chairs a national group on um, biodiversity and and we've we're setting up a steering group that will involve people like um, Natural England and CSH, but um, there'll also be regional coordinators. So we could look at um, for those um, high level overviews, whether there could be trained people maybe per, per region. I think certainly look at the same website and when, once they start providing um, metric training again, it would be worth maybe getting those coordinators to have a look at that and understand how it works and um, the, the the different habitat types that they'd need to be able to differentiate between. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, Charlotte, the future NHS collaboration hub, it's the estates, um, national estates one. I think that the green space guidance might also be on the green NHS one, but if you, um, I'll put my email in the chat and if you send me an email we can get you registered on the estates one but as i said unfortunately it is only for nhs um people at the moment so that's why we're trying to work to get it onto the nhs e website um patrick's asked a question again bng but is the 10 percent still a requirement for an existing hospital which is being redeveloped 
um, for different or new infrastructure. So does it apply to anything that needs planning permission or is uh, yeah. so it excludes refurbs? So um, there's it not necessarily refurbs. So um, when I mentioned the exemptions, so you need to look out for the exemptions um, statutory instruments. So that will set out exactly what is exempt. So if if you if you just changing an existing building, then that will fall below the de minimis threshold. So there's something about if the development will impact less than 25 square meters of habitat, then it doesn't, it, it falls out of scope. So if you've got an existing building and you're just changing what's going on inside it, then it won't. Uh, once the footprint gets above a certain size, it depends whether it's affecting habitat or not. Um, so yeah, so you need you need to basically wait until that's published and then you'll be able to decide. But if you're just changing the internal workings of a building, no, you won't need to. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that once the guidance comes out, things should be a lot um a lot clearer. clearer. Right. Yeah. Um so Rachel Roberts has gone off topic, which is fine. We really love that. She was wondering if anyone can lend advice or research on how to show increased canopy cover, wildflowers and leaf litter will not exacerbate infections of people in hospital with weakened immune systems is that outside of the knowledge of the panel certainly outside of my knowledge uh, i haven't come across much for wildflower uh, funding around but um what we do need to look at uh, and as a national group we're looking at the myth busting aspect so some of this this stuff that's coming through so um looking at ponds um the smell associated with some in some people's heads looking at legionella challenges with water butts um leaf litter uh, again so any of these kind of the, the kickback that quite a lot of us gets from estates teams we need to kind of work through what we can do for alleviating some of that that those problems that many of them got so if anybody's got those those challenges put sticker in the chat and we'll see if we can kind of come up with the solutions and ways around it um on the funding for wildflower meadows i haven't seen anything as such but the, we are looking at um, a couple of associations and discounted rates for for wildflower um seeds which again there's there's a big push on that alongside of um uh, uh, trees for wildflowers so yellow rattle is in, in major short supply across the UK but um, there are local you should start looking at wildflowers that um, seeds that are local to your area in order to create that endemic uh, species multiplication type thing so there, there are lots of phenotypes and lots of specific plants that are regional that we need to kind of help uh, promote as well. Fantastic thank you Right, I think probably you've just got um one um question that's um technical about BNG again. So Peter from Mid Yorks has asked, is the cost of a unit an upfront fee that covers the 30 years maintenance period? And if so, does it include inflation? Um uh, just to make sure that people will be covered for the the um the space that they've set aside for bng credits for the full life of the 30 years so so i would say to you um the cost is if you if you're selling the unit the cost is up to you and you should inc you should include all the costs you're likely to incur in that price um there is guidance on the gov.uk website already about the types of things you can include um you can include the cost of setting up the legal agreement you can cost you can include insurance in case you don't achieve what you say you're going to achieve there's a whole list of things you can put into that cost and I did mention making sure that your legal people know what they can and can't do or what they should be doing in terms of uh, drawing up legal agreements because again it's up to you whether you would like to receive a one-off payment or whether you want to receive payment at different intervals across that 30-year period you could have an annual payment or you could have it in in blocks it's in, it's really up to you how it works best for you and it would it would depend if you're selling to a developer whether they're happy with that principle or whether they just want you know to get rid of the, the whole the, the money and have it done and dusted so it, it is a it is a bit of a negotiation um and it is entirely up to you but you should absolutely not be out of pocket um, okay at the end of it that's fantastic thank you right um so we've just got four minutes before you hand back to Sarah. So rather than just go through the last of the questions, which we could answer later, 
I just ask each of the panel members just for your top tips. So, Carl, if we start with you, top tips for how the NHS can engage with the wider community or, or how the wider community can engage with NHS? I would say partnership working all the way. I know I already mentioned it, but I think work with your local authorities, work with your local uh, woodland creation schemes and work with your local volunteers to get the message out there that you want more trees and trees will come. <laughs> Fantastic. That makes it sound very easy. Um, Jim, if we go to you, um, you showed a lot of guidance, which I know you've been instrumental in, in writing. How can What's the best way for someone who works in an NHS estate to try and make sense of all the, the guidance in a simple, simple fashion? In terms of getting trees planted on their on the on their location, I think it's um, really to look at um, if if the site is in a pre-existing site and you've got space, um, come to the FC or to the local authority tree officer to to get some help in terms of um, what should be planted on the site. Happy to do that. Um, we've got area teams now who are available available to do so, um, uh, and uh, you know contact me. I'm I'm happy to to give some advice about that. In terms of redevelopment of sites. Um, that is the opportunity as i showed you with the whittington hospital there were more trees planted on the site after that development than when when it when it when it was started so um in terms of if you're if you know your role is uh, uh, to, to actually uh, take part in that um again look at the local policies the local plan policies of the local authorities uh, and see how that um, tree planting could be uh, incorporated into those sites as well as talking to as i said um, senior managers because it was the chief executive of the Whittington Trust who got those trees planted. So. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then Amanda, if if you're if we've got people watching here, we know that they've got um, big projects coming up in the next two or three years on NHS estates. What what should they be starting to do now while we've got the time? So I, I keep coming back to this baseline. So so yeah. Work, work out what your baseline is there identify where the best place is to if, if you're actually building footprint of, of development where's the best place to put it and actually I think anyone who is thinking about doing any positive habitat creation tree planting get your get a baseline on that now before you do it so that you've got that in the bag you've, you can bank it and you can use it for those developments I think that's probably the, the single okay. best advice I can give you it's, it's more about yeah just use news now as day one and just say anything we do positive beyond now we're going to we're going to baseline and we're going to measure it so we, we've got it in the bag for our for our future developments fantastic i'm sure all the nhs forest team will be very keen that this is day one everyone's moving forward now so the nhs forest conference was day one amazing and then if we just finished with our keynote alexis um top tips you've obviously achieved loads at yorkshire ambulance service so what can people in nhs trust get started with nice and easily so to kind of hark back to what everybody else has said, start with a plan, start with the key engagement. It's all about people all the way through this process. So you need to have a map, you need to go to your states team, you need to go to chief exec, you need to go to all those that are going to grumble and maybe have a bit of a barrier, but also bring them with you on the journey. And then it's about building momentum as you go through it. So right tree, right place, wildflower meadows, um, touchy feely stuff, engagement with patients, engagement with everybody that visits the site, but also it's engagement with the wildlife species that are going to be inhabiting it. So they need to be part of that journey as well. And at some, it might be a case of introduction, it might be a case of product, um, protection, and it might also be about providing them with homes all the way through the process. So uh, it's it's a journey for everybody, and it starts with the idea um, and it starts with the motivation and there are some amazing people out there that can help you with that entire process. Fantastic. Thank you. Right. So thanks to all the panelists. That's I think that's been a brilliant session. Learn absolutely loads. Um, and then if I pass back to Sarah now, she's going to do the wrap up before we go into the next session. Thanks everybody. Fantastic. Thank you, Ian. And thank you to all of our panellists for that session. That was really interesting and really useful information for everyone who's thinking about increasing biodiversity on their sites. Um, uh, as a reminder, as I mentioned earlier, we have trees available for any NHS sites um, who would like to plant them. Um, so do have a look at our website. We can also offer advice um, around that as well. Um, in line with some of the things that we've just been talking about in that session.